everybody, welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast Show here on CBS Sports HQ, presented by Guinness. Will Brinson, Ryan Wilson, and John Breach hanging out on this Friday, the final weekday before the Super Bowl. I, I, I was so excited for the show. I sprinted up here at like 4 o'clock, because we were sitting here waiting for this show to start to spend this afternoon with you guys. Let's, uh, let's talk some football. First, we're going to discuss situations involving quarterbacks and where they might go and you can't start anywhere else Wilson other than Carson Wentz the much maligned Eagles quarterback there's a buzz heavy buzz I believe Les Bowen of the Philly Inquirer uh, Philly.com reported that a trade could be happening soon what do you think Wilson where's the best landing spot for Carson Wentz well, uh, until 24 hours ago, I thought it would be Philadelphia but because I thought the whole situation with the Doug Peterson getting canned was that Carson Wentz won that power struggle. Nick Sirianni was hired from Indianapolis. He has ties to Frank Reich. Everything is going to be great. Uh, I would only imagine that Nick Sirianni went into that conversation for the job interview and said, hey, I can make Carson Wentz pretend it's 2017 again. And then we hear the report, you mentioned Les Bowen, uh, where a lot of teams are apparently hot on Carson Wentz's trail, which is interesting given how poorly he's played in recent years. And also, we saw a report from Jeff McClain, uh, also out of Philadelphia, that Carson Wentz hasn't been the best teammate, uh, at least over the course of the last year when Jalen Hurts took over his job at the end of the season there. All that said, and knowing all that, What's the best landing spot for players that have baggage? The uh, New England Patriots, they've done it throughout their history with guys, typically not at quarterback, but they've had guys at other positions come in, most notably Randy Moss came in and played at a really high level, go further back. Corey Dillon, the running back, came in, played at a really high level. Uh, both those guys helped that team to Super Bowls uh, at different times. And I think Carson Wentz will come in, work with Josh McDaniels, uh, who it's clearly very good at coordinating up offenses with different type of uh, quarterbacks. We saw last year they didn't have a ton of success with Cam Newton, but they have that flavor of athleticism uh, with Carson Wentz. And if you can get him anything close to what he was doing in 2017, now you're cooking with gas. Now you're behind the Bills in the division. Perhaps the Dolphins are going to be in the mix as well. But I think Carson Wentz, with the structure in place in New England, with the history of success, both the Bill Belichick, the head coach, and with Josh McDaniels, the offensive coordinator, that is a great landing spot for a guy looking to refine his footing when it comes to being an NFL franchise quarterback. Ryan, I am glad that you just rehashed all those Carson Wentz trade details because now I don't have to. Uh, you know what, though? You mentioned getting him back to 2017 form where he was an MVP candidate for most of the season before he got injured. There is no one better to get him back to 2017 form than the guy who was coaching him in 2017, and that was Frank Reich. That was Frank Reich's final season in Philadelphia before he ended up getting hired as the Colts head coach. So I think that is Carson Wentz's best landing spot. If you're the Eagles, you call up Indianapolis and you just say, we're tired. We'll take whatever offer you have. This guy cannot start for us anymore. We want to ship him off. And you seem like a good landing spot. Look, we know the Colts are one quarterback away. We thought it was Andrew Luck. He decided to retire. They had to throw Jacoby Brissett in there. They still had a decent season, even though they had to do that on the fly uh, with a quarterback who didn't know he's going to start. They brought Phillip Rivers in. He got them to the playoffs. And now Frank Reich, uh, you know what? I think Carson Wentz probably has a pretty low confidence level right now. He got benched for Jalen Hurts. Uh, well, if there's someone who can up that confidence level, it is definitely Frank Reich, who knows what Carson Wentz is capable of uh, and, and was with him for two seasons, also with him in 2016 besides 2017. And also, is Nick Suriani, is he some sort of double agent? It feels like he took the job in Philly, called up Frank Reich, and was like, all right, man, I'll ship Carson Wentz off to you because I want to bring my own quarterback in, uh, or I want Jalen Hurts to start. I actually think this will work out well for both teams because now Suriani is not stuck with Carson Wentz, you want somebody pouting uh, as your starting quarterback. And then obviously it works out well for Frank Wright because he's reunited with Carson Wentz. Hey, speaking of quarterback trades, we just got traded a quarterback of our own. We sent, uh, we sent Pete Prisco two first round picks for Danny Cannell who joins us from, uh, <laughs> there's nothing that gives me like, and I don't mean joy, but like, I'm enjoying seeing you in the conditions this week, Danny. I feel like every time you're out on that set, there's some sort of, it's cold, it's windy, <laughs> it cracks you up. What do you think about Carson Wentz? How it you is, doing, first of all? So, what do you think about Carson Wentz and where you should go? I'm great. When I used to drive to Giant Stadium, I would look on the side of the road. If I saw like garbage swirling, I was like, uh oh, it's going to be a long day. I never thought I would be in a position where I'd worry about the wind because my hair would be all over the place. So here we are. It is 
blustery. It is a lot of like 30, 40 mile an hour gusts here in Tampa. We're going to power through it because that's what we do. I think I'm, I'm with Breach on this one. I think the Colts make way too much sense. I think it's obvious. I think it makes sense for both sides. I think Frank Reich with the relationship, he remembers the great Carson Wentz, the one that was in the conversation for the MVP back in 2017. And I think Carson Wentz needs a change of scenery. I think if he gets reunited with Frank Reich, it'll give him a fresh start. Clearly he wants one with all these rumors, asking out. And you know what else? The Colts can actually handle the contract with only Jacoby Brissett under contract at the quarterback position. They've got the, uh, the space to absorb Carson Wentz's contract. So I think it makes a ton of sense. And I think both sides would be actually pretty happy with this playing out. You know, uh, look, Danny, I'll, I'll tell you this, though. You make it past the age of 40 with multiple children and you've got hair that's blowing in the wind, you're doing something right. Wilson would kill for that hair. He'd be <laughs> flopping all over his house right now. Uh, as for Carson Wentz, here's my location for Carson Wentz. Here's where I want him to go. Siberia. I'm tired of Carson Wentz. It's a bunch of nonsense that Carson Wentz can help submarine the Eagles down the stretch, and then he gets Doug Peterson fired, and now he demands a trade because he's not happy enough there. Like, I get – like, Sean Watson's one thing, right? I mean, the organization clearly made a mistake. He played – he was a good soldier throughout the Bill O'Brien stuff, even when they traded Hopkins and all of that. But Wentz, he's been terrible, awful on the field, a pain in the rear off of it. So I say send him to Siberia, and if that won't work, then send him to the Bears because the Bears suck and they need some Carson Wentz in their lives. And I want them to be terrible again with Carson Wentz in that contract. Um, that's my take on Carson Wentz. Clearly, I don't know if I've heard against Carson Wentz so heavily. Uh, I don't want him to ruin my – as a lifelong Colts fan, I don't want him the guy who follows him. Uh, how about Deshaun Watson, Danny? Uh, Watson, of course, still rumored to be traded at some point this offseason. Where do you think is the best landing spot for the disgruntled Houston Texans quarterback? So I really hope this happens. I would love to see it happen to get him on the Miami Dolphins. I think it makes a ton of sense. Uh, you know, the Dolphins are a team that's bright. They're young. I know they just drafted Tua, but even Tua admitted that his rookie season was below average. And they've seen him now for a year. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if you would see a move made here. They've got the draft capital to do it. It does feel like the thing they're missing is a franchise quarterback with some experience. With a black head coach, we know that was important to Sean Watson. One of the things he was looking for. They've got that Miami, not only a black head coach, but also a black general manager who are doing a fantastic job building, uh, you know, both sides of the ball. And it really does feel like the only piece missing is that franchise quarterback. We saw Ryan Fitzpatrick have a tremendous amount of success there. And I actually think the Texans, they could bring in Tua. Maybe you give a couple draft picks, a similar type trade as what we saw with Detroit and LA with, uh, with golf and with Stafford. You might have to throw in a couple more pieces because of Deshaun Watson having a little bit more years left on him, the perception of him, and the Tua uncertainty. But I think if you're the Dolphins, I think you say make this trade happen. Danny, I'm right there with you. I like the Dolphins as well. And you mentioned those draft picks. And the best thing about those draft picks, you can send the third overall pick, the 18th overall pick, and the 36th overall pick. Two of those three picks, those came from Houston, the Larry Tunsil trade. Just send them back. Uh, include a gift basket along with it, maybe some pears and some bananas, uh, a few uh, a box of candy or something else. You can even, uh, even have Tua deliver all that uh, as you send him uh, west to Houston. Because I think at the end of the day, and, and the Texans can say whatever they want, and I know they sort of have to say uh, Deshaun Watson's our quarterback, but he's their quarterback up until the moment that he ain't their quarterback. And I don't feel like he's going to start the season in Houston uh, once we get late summer, early fall. I think like the best case scenario for him, and, and the reports have been that one of the places he would love to go would be Miami. Uh, part of that probably because, uh, hey, no one likes paying taxes, and that's a great place to be if you don't pay t income tax, number one. Number two, they won 10 games last year with Ryan Fitzpatrick and Tua. Number three, as you mentioned, Danny, they have a head coach and, and a general manager who are both African-American. Those check all the boxes for Deshaun Watson. They're going to be competitive because they were last year. There's no Tom Brady in that division, so they're going to be in the mix with the Bills. And, and I think Deshaun Watson is the one player not only that has the most leverage in the NFL when it comes to deciding what he wants to do, but they can put the Dolphins over the hump from 10 wins and being on the, on the cusp of being a playoff team to 12, 13 wins and being a legit Super Bowl team. Speaking of taxes, Wilson, I don't think you've paid those in six years, so you can live in any state and not pay your taxes if you know the right people. Uh, but I actually like your guys' idea with the Dolphins. I love the idea of 
the Texans being forced to trade for their own picks back and having to give up to Sean Watson. That's some draft day level stuff. Hollywood writers came up with the craziest thing they could think of. Uh, and the Dolphins and Texans might have to, to actually live that out. Uh, but I actually think the Deshaun Watson best landing spot would be the Denver Broncos. Uh, we saw Kareem Jackson talk with TMZ this week. He said he has just been trying to get Deshaun uh, to convince someone to trade him to Denver. He thinks Deshaun Watson will put them over the hump. And I absolutely agree with that. I think Denver becomes an instant contender. You look at their offensive nucleus. They have uh, Melvin Gordon, Phillip Lindsay, Jerry Judy, Noah Fant. So they have all of those offensive weapons. You put a mobile quarterback back there who's also accurate, can throw the ball. Uh, and I think all of a sudden you have a high-powered offense that you just don't have with Drew Luck. And we saw reports uh, that the Broncos were in on the Matthew Stafford trade talks. They were ready to ship Drew Luck off uh, if Detroit would have just signed off on that deal. But they didn't. And so the, right now the Broncos are stuck with Drew Luck. So if somehow Sean Watson can finagle his way to Denver, I, I think that that would be a good fit. And then the AFC West would be loaded uh, with Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Deshaun Watson, and Brinson's boy, Derek Carr. Yeah, I mean, that's why you don't want to go to the AFC West if you're Deshaun Watson. You kind of control it because of your, your situation with your no trade clause. I think I don't understand why people don't like the Jets. I know this is going to sound insane, but I feel like with Joe Douglas there and bringing in Robert Sala, the Jets have a stable feel about them. That's kind of insane. And I get that they don't have the most talent around them, but you go, you go to New York. And if you're Deshaun Watson, there's a reason why he was rumored to be interested in going to the Jets. It's because he wants to go to the Big Apple and spread his brand. He wants his brand to be blowing up billboards. Bring back the Jets. Watson can win with anyone. If Watson can win in, in Houston, he can win anywhere. And look at these picks. You got so much to work with. If you're the Jets, you don't have you can give away number two. You can send a, a first round pick next year after you get Watson, a second round pick next year. You give him uh, I don't know, 34 as well, and then throw in Sam Darnold. And that's the the win for the Texans here is that they can look at Sam Darnold and say, all right, this guy's still young. He's still possibly a franchise quarterback. We can make that work. And the reason why I picked the Jets over the Dolphins is I'm so spiteful. If I gave those picks to the Dolphins, I'm not taking them back. I don't want them back. I don't want to know that I had the, price, the tax that I had to pay to get my picks back was giving you Deshaun Watson. That sounds all you basically trade Laramie Tunsil for Deshaun Watson. No, thank you. No interest in that another quarterback Danny who could potentially be on the move depending on how things shake out in San Francisco and the other dominoes Jimmy Garoppolo if Jimmy Garoppolo moves on from San Francisco or if they trade for Deshaun Watson and, and cut him loose what's a great landing spot for Jimmy G oh come on you gotta go back to the Patriots right that's the place who found him they discovered him and wouldn't it be great if uh, if uh, his old coach Bill Belichick brought him in and revived his career it would mean the world to him because look at what's it, how he's been getting bashed in this whole Tom Brady situation. The way he goes to the Bucks and wins, the Patriots were awful. I still think they, you know, kind of similar to the Carson Wentz, when they had him in uh, New England, they raved about him. They apparently didn't want to give him up. There's a relationship there, a history of, of action that's taken place with John Lynch, the general manager of the 49ers and the Patriots. I think this is the piece, too. I think they're comfortable with him. They know his work ethic, and they would love nothing more to try to get this franchise back on track. The history's there. I think it makes a ton of sense. So I'm going to say Jimmy Garoppolo back to New England. I like that, Danny. I'm going to go with the Broncos. I know Breach just mentioned Deshaun Watson to the Broncos. That's a home run. But if that doesn't work out, a backup plan could be Jimmy GQ. The issue, of course, is that we haven't seen a lot of success out of Drew Locke in his two years there. There's been many valleys that there have been peaks. In fact, you argue more valleys. Breach ran through the list of playmakers they have on that team. Jerry, Judy, Cortland Sutton will be back. Noah Fant, KJ Hamler. They have the running backs in Lindsey and Melvin Gordon. So they have the players in place. Their defense is in transition. They're going to lose some guys in the back end. Will Von Miller come back? They do have Bradley Chubb there. They do have Justin Simmons there as well. So they're in transition, but they also have in, in someone in Jimmy GQ, a quarterback who has proven that he can win the games you need to win. And we haven't seen that from Drew Locke. Uh, Pat Shermer is the offensive coordinator. He does a good job with the young quarterbacks. Historically, he's done that. He hasn't been great as the head coach at two stints with the Giants and the Browns. But when it comes to being a coordinator, he's had some success. And I think that's that, that stability, along with those playmakers, uh, can help Jimmy GQ along. Now, the issue, of course, you're playing in the same division as the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes. So you're always playing for second place. But at the end of the day, you can live with that if you're getting to the playoffs. And I think Jimmy G certainly gives them a much better opportunity to do that than you have currently with Drew Locke. Yeah, Ryan, if uh, the Broncos can't land Deshaun Watson, I do like the Jimmy G idea, but 
I agree with Danny Canal here. I think that the Patriots make the most sense. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't have to learn a new system. The coaching staff is already comfortable with him. He can just hit the ground running in New England. And also, Bill Belichick probably would love to win a Super Bowl with Jimmy G. Just imagine, right now, that Belichick-Brady argument, Tom Brady just sprinted out to the lead because he is in the Super Bowl this year. If Belichick turns around and wins two Super Bowls with Jimmy Garoppolo, uh, then he retakes the GOAT status in that argument. So I think the Patriots make the most sense. Uh, you know what? I'm going to say the Colts because uh, we, you know, look, the Colts are a team that is run heavy, uh, love to do the play action stuff. It's very not too dissimilar for what you might see out of, uh, you know, out of a Kyle Shanahan scheme. Not exactly the same, of course, but I think Jimmy Garoppolo, I can just kind of picture him in that Colts uniform, some decent weapons there. I could see that being a nice little fit. So I'm going to say the Colts. Uh, and before we let you go, Danny, um, or Big Earn McCracken. Uh, you got Big Earn's got the hair going there. Uh, well, give me your uh, give me your favorite <laughs> Super Bowl moment uh, that, that you that you recall. Um, you know, what, you, what's your top Super Bowl moment of all time? Yeah. So my top Super Bowl, personally for me, I was 16 years old. I came to Tampa for Super Bowl 25 with the Bills versus the Giants. I came with my dad, my two brother-in-laws, and it wasn't the fact that the Giants won the Super Bowl. I wasn't a Giants fan with the Scott Norwood miss. It was one of the greatest Super Bowl moments of all time. It was Whitney Houston singing the national uh, anthem in that white jumpsuit that she wore. There were helicopters hovering in the end zone because of the security security issues with the Gulf War going on. It was one of the most unbelievable emotional moments I have ever witnessed in sports. Everyone was tearing up in their eyes, including Whitney Houston. Phenomenal sports moment. To me, it's bigger than any moment even that happened on the field in the Super Bowl history. Fantastic pick for that, uh, Danny. By the way, that is a fun fact about that, 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 that national anthem. It's the only time in his life that Pete Prisco has ever cried. So if you want to point out to him that uh, that he got emotional during that Whitney Houston moment, feel free to. Danny, thank you, as always, for hanging out with us. You spent all week kicking it here on the Pick 6 Podcast Show. You are the best. Uh, we're going to cut Danny loose, take a break, and when we come back, we'll, uh, we'll talk some Super Bowl props here on CBS Sports HQ. All right, welcome back to the Pick 6 Podcast Show here on CBS Sports HQ, presented by Guinness. I'm Will Brinson. Joining us now, Emory Hunt, also Ryan Wilson, and John Breach hanging around. And by the way, man, I would, uh, look, I'm not saying I would rather be sitting on my couch slamming a Guinness right now and talking to you guys, but I might. Uh, anyway, let's uh, let's talk some, uh, some Super Bowl props. Emory live from Atlantic City. I always love how you're always in a sports book, Emory. You always got great advice. Give me a, give us sort of the read of what a sports book looks like on Super Bowl weekend in a pandemic because I'm guessing it's a little different than normal. Well, it's it's kind of empty, and it's you know, uh, and it's Friday, but it's only one game that everyone is really worried about. It's the Super Bowl on Sunday, but it's been rather quiet here uh, all day long here at the William Hill Sportsbook at Tropicana Casino. All right, <laughs> we got some. Uh, oh, you know what? We might get if we. Oh uh, no, if we, if we. This show is running at six o'clock. We might get me appearing on Time to Shine. We get some. Put some Brinson on your Brinson for your Brinson, like a like a meme type situation. Nobody nobody wants that. Uh, anyway, let's get down to some top props. So we're going to start with uh, heavily juiced props. Now there is nothing wrong with taking with laying some juice on a Super Bowl prop. If you think it's going to hit, you just got to make sure you know you can even it out. Don't put too much on it because you know if, if it's not good value. Emery, what's a uh, heavily juiced prop you like out there? You know the. One that I really like is the fact that the Chiefs will be the first one to score 20 points. Their offense is just set up to score anything over 25 points. So them scoring the first points, our first 20 points, or getting 20 points first is the best prop I like right out of the gate. I'm right there with you, Emory. I love the Chiefs, the first team to 20 points. We know that the Chiefs start slow in the last uh, four of the last five playoff games, uh, Super Bowls, and then they come on strong. And Breach has made this point all week. Guess who else starts slow? Tom Brady. So I think it's going to be pretty close early on. I do think that the Chiefs uh, may even find themselves behind after a quarter, maybe in a halftime. But I think by the end of the day, they'll win the football game. And before the end of the day, they'll be the first team to 20 points. Uh, I was going to use that same prop. But we don't use the same one three times in a row. So I'm going to go with a different prop. 
Uh, I'm going to go with uh, there is going to be a score in the final three and a half minutes of the game. If you bet yes on that, uh, the odds you're getting are negative 210. You know what? Not great, but it seems like a gimme. You're talking about two of the greatest quarterbacks in the NFL possibly ever, and all they have to do is one of them has to lead their team to a field goal in the final three and a half minutes of the game. That just seems like free money to me. Uh, Patrick Mahomes leading a two-minute drive, getting a field goal, you win the bet. Tom Brady leading a two-minute drive in the fourth quarter to a field goal, you win the bet. Uh, maybe there's a safety. Who knows? It could be something crazy, uh, but I love this at negative 210. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good bet, Breach. And, you know, that's the problem. When you group these props like this by the various juices, you end up in a situation where, you know, there's only a few choices for each person to make. So maybe you double up and sometimes it makes it a little clunky. But what are you going to do? Uh, look, I'll take Patrick Mahomes over minus 150 on his passing touchdowns, two and a half. I think Mahomes is going to throw three passing touchdowns. I think the Bucks are a pass funnel. I don't think you can run against them. And remember, when we talk about getting down to the goal line, getting in involved uh you know in those short five yardage five yard situations they're not even necessarily going to pound daryl williams or clyde edwards alaire they use those jet sweep little flips all the time they use the shovel passes all these quick sort of cheap passes are built into Andy Reid's playbook and allows Patrick Mahomes to pick up these short yardage touchdown passes, and that's how he gets to over three. And uh, I should note that, that that juice moved up to 170 earlier in the week. It's actually down to 150. I would bet it now before it moves back up at William Hill. Moving up, by the way, I like the over on the anthem, basically blindly, and depending on what, whatever the juice is. I think it's like minus 150 I saw. I couldn't find it on William Hill though, so uh, check that out as well. Uh, Emery looking at props eat between even and 10 to one. Uh, what sort of props do you like? You know, basically even money. What sort of props do you like in that range? You know, I kind of like a, a Chiefs double play here where you're going to look at Tyreek Hill, his first reception going over 12 and a half yards. Listen, I've been on this sh this network all week long saying Tyreek Hill will get over 28 and a half yards for his longest reception. So this one right here falls right in line with that. That's number one. And number two, the first Chiefs touchdown, the first touchdown score will be Travis Kelsey at plus 750. And the reason why I believe that to be so, I think Tyreek Hill will get them down the on the big chunk play, and Travis Kelsey would be the direct beneficiary of a cheap short touchdown. So, everybody likes Tyreek Hill for the first reception over 12 and a half yards. I like Ty Tyreek Hill for the first Chiefs player to catch a pass. If you go back to week 12, the very first play of the game, a little RPO wheel route, Tyreek Hill. He caught that pass. They ran that play about four or five times throughout the game, uh, targeted various receivers and running backs. Uh, but I think Tyreek Hill does not only beat you deep, he can beat you on the wheel route. He can beat you on a quick out, which you saw at the end of the last few games in recent weeks. So Tyreek Hill makes a lot of sense for me there. And the other one that I love a lot, Breach, and you're not going to believe this because you only care about special teams, the first accepted penalty is going to be an offsides a neutral zone infraction or an encroachment. That sounds crazy, but the Chiefs are the best offensively in making defenses jump, and Tampa Bay is second to worst at jumping. So I love that that uh, that bet a lot as uh, something that might make you a little money there. Well, you know what, Wilson? If you would have bet the odds that I would have a special teams prop here, you would have lost your bet because I'm not going with special teams. And instead, I am going with uh, my first prop here is that the last play of the game will not be a QB rush, and the odds on that are plus 140. Uh, now, to win this bet, all you need is for the game not to end with a quarterback kneeling the ball. And how's that gonna happen? Well, if the team that is losing the game has the ball in the fourth quarter, they're not gonna kneel it. They're gonna keep throwing it, they're gonna keep passing it, try and move the ball downfield, uh, and so that's what you hope for. And both of these quarterbacks are so good, but I do think if one of them is playing from behind, uh, you're going to milk the clock down as far as possible because you don't want the other quarterback to have a chance to get the ball back uh, to possibly lead their team to score. Uh, and then the other prop I like here is Patrick Mahomes to score a touchdown at any point in the game, a rushing touchdown, and then combine that with a Chiefs win, and you get plus 500. Uh, to me, that is a crazy high number, 5-1. to one. This has happened in three of Kansas City's last four playoff games, including last year's Super Bowl. Uh, Patrick Mahomes has 11 career rushing touchdowns. That includes the postseason. The Chiefs are 10 and one in those games. So if Mahomes gets a rushing touchdown, the Chiefs win. You get five to one odds here. I'm jumping on that. 
Look, Breach, uh, I gave you the thumbs down there because I assume that you heard me talking about all week that my buddy Garrett talked me into betting last play will be a QB rush at minus 150. We bet it last weekend, and you're just taking a, a chance in our final show of the, of the week. We're going to do live streaming on Twitch and on uh, YouTube as well before, during, and after the game, so check that out. Uh, but I assume you took that as a chance to take a personal shot at me, and I don't appreciate it. I don't know. Don't even ask what I'm holding. It's a long story. Um, the, uh, it's a corn cob. Uh, anyway, the um, I'm going to take uh, <laughs> I'm going to take for my prop. When I look at this, I'm going to actually add a couple in. I think one I absolutely love Patrick Mahomes over pass attempts 40 and a half. As I mentioned, the Bucks are a pass funnel. They have a great run defense. Vita Vea is back. The Chiefs are a pass happy team. Andy Reid will adjust his game plan to what you want to do on defense, what you're good at on defense, and he would love nothing more than to pass the ball. I even think if the Chiefs get a double digit lead, they'll be throwing short yardage passes to try and keep the clock running while not sacrificing actual production on drives with the run game. So I love that over. I think Tyreek Hill's over receiving yards. Anything under 100 basically is, is going to be is a good bet. I think it's like 93 and a half or 96 and a half at William Hill. You can also take Tyreek Hill over longest catch, 27 and a half. Lock button on that, baby. Tyreek Hill doesn't catch short passes. He's going to jailbreak one for sure on there. And then I actually love the, um, if you go to William Hill and you look under specials, there's one here, plus 150. Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes both have over 299 and a half passing yards. It's a little parlay. You're getting a discount on their, uh, their, their total number there. I think that's a pretty good bet as well. All right, Emery, let's talk about some long shots, 10 to 1 or more. What, uh, what out there do you like in the market that, that could give us a big payoff? You know, this was more of a calculated long shot. The Chiefs to score exactly 31 points. I've been stuck on that number all week. I think that's going to be what they will score in this game. And the other long shot, let's say the Bucks get the ball first and they go down the field and score. The person to score the first touchdown in the game, Cameron break the tight end. I think that's the matchup that they're going to try to exploit because their other tight end, I, I don't know if you guys heard of him, uh, he's more of a blocker now, an athletic left or right tackle. So he won't get in the end zone. The other tight end will, Cameron Brait. So those are my two long shot bets. I like it, Emory. I'm going to go with another tight end, Travis Kelsey, 11 to 1 for MVP. Uh, Tampa Bay loves to play zone defense. Travis Kelsey loves going up against his own defenses. He absolutely eats versus his own defenses. He was targeted eight times last time in that Week 12 matchup for 82 yards. All versus zone. Tampa Bay ranks 25th against tight ends. I think this is a great matchup for Travis Kelsey to have a shot at MVP. The other one that I like is my guy Sammy Watkins, 20 to 1, first TD score. Now, Sammy Watkins has been injured since week 16, but when he plays in the postseason, he puts up huge numbers. A lot of the reason is that defenses are going to target and focus on trying to stop Tyree Kill and the aforementioned Travis Kelsey. And if that happens, that's going to be more opportunities for Sammy Watkins. I think there's a chance for him to get into the end zone early, and I think there's a chance for him to actually have a big game if the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense tries to shut down the Chiefs' two best receivers. Uh, for me, I have to say I like where Emery's head is at. I'm going the same route as him with the Chiefs' exact points, except I think they're going to score a little bit more uh, than 31. I'm going to go with 38. The odds there to score exactly 38 are plus 2,000, 20 to 1. Look, we saw them do it in the AFC Championship game. They scored exactly 38, and the Chiefs seem to be good for four or five touchdowns a game and one field goal. So it does really feel like that 38 is a good bet. And as Emery just said, I also like 31. Uh, that was plus 1,200. And you know what? The Chiefs have played seven career playoff games with Patrick Mahomes. They have scored exactly 31 points in three of them. I mean, that's insane. So you're talking about 31 or 38 in more than half of their playoff games with Mahomes. I think either one of those are a good bet. 38 is plus 2,000. 31 is plus 1,200. All right, I dig it, Breach. Uh, for my long shot uh, on the in the Super Bowl, I'm going to strike early, and I'm going to take home some cash. And here's how: I'm going to take Patrick Mahomes to score the first touchdown, 16 to one. 
at William and Hill. William Hill, excuse me. If you look at what the Chiefs like to do, there's a you can just picture it in your head, right? They have Travis Kelsey run like flood across the middle. Tyreek Hill comes streaking across. They run on a jet sweep. They get all the defenders running one way, and then Mahomes sprint right option to the right. There's nobody covering him. Daryl Williams in the backfield. He doesn't pitch it, and he walks in, and we're cashing that 16 to one ticket out of the gate. Man, let's go get rich in this Super Bowl. Um, Emery, <laughs> Actually, obviously Tyreek Hill is going to score first. Emery, what's uh, what's your best Super Bowl bet? Then? My best Super Bowl bet is a defensive one. Devin White going over 10 and a half total tackles in the ball game. He's a tackling machine, and when you tack on the assist to this tackle number, that's an easy number for him to hit. This is a guy that goes sideline to sideline. Uh, he, he'll always have a key on the run game. He also does a great job in being where he's supposed to be in zone coverage, so he's there to make a stop on what I expect to be a lot of short passes to the tight end, so he'll make those tackles. He'll have at least 50 15 tackles in this ball game. That's my best bet uh, for the Super Bowl. Ryan Wilson, what's your best bet for the Super Bowl? Oh, I didn't know we were doing my best bet. Sorry, I thought it was just Emory. Uh, they were doing Emory uh, Super Bowl memory. We'll be next. Uh, after that, Wilson, I can tell you that your best bet is Sammy Watkins over receiving yards. Oh, it sure is. Look at that. I was so pumped about talking about Sammy Watkins last time that I forgot about this Sammy Watkins. Over 37 and a half, I sort of laid out the reasons a few minutes ago. If they try to double team Tyreek and try to double team Kelsey, that's more opportunities for Sammy, for Demarcus Robinson, for Miko Hardman, and Sammy's gonna be healthy after that calf injury. Hasn't played since week 16. If you go back to the last four postseason games, Sammy hasn't had fewer than 74 receiving yards, so there's no reason to think he won't have another huge game if he is in fact healthy. Uh, for me, I don't need Brinson to read it off because I know my best bet. My goodness, Wilson. Uh, it is for the game to be tied after 0 0. This is Old Faithful for me. The very first time I placed a bet in a sportsbook for the Super Bowl was for Super Bowl 49, and it was this bet. It hit in Super Bowl 49. It hit in Super Bowl 51. It hit in Super Bowl 52. It hit in Super Bowl 53. It hit in Super Bowl 54. It has hit in five of the past six Super Bowls. And if you think this game is going to be close at all, chances are it is going to be tied at some point after 0 0. And at negative 130, I think those are fantastic odds. 3 3 7 7 10 10, whatever it is, the bet hits if the game is tied at any point after 0 0. And I think this one absolutely will be. Uh, you know, I already hit my best bet. I took Wilson at 15 to one to be the guy who creates the awkward moment on Friday's show uh, <laughs> by a lack of awareness. I think I was like minus 250 on the on the on the book. So uh, so you know, sometimes you got to take the long shot. Uh, look, I will take the Chiefs minus three. We'll make it pretty simple. I think the Chiefs are going to win. I think the Chiefs are going to win big. I think people are going to be shocked at what Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid do to this defense. People are going to be surprised when Tom Brady uh, is really involved in. Frankly, his first not close Super Bowl in a long time. And the Chiefs roll here, winning by double digits. So I will absolutely lay the three with the Chiefs. Emery, what is your uh, favorite, before we get you out of here, what's your favorite Super Bowl moment? Listen, I'm so glad CBS Sports HQ, the Pick 6 Pod, everyone gave me this platform to say this right now. Born and raised in New Orleans, my favorite memory as a true diehard Saints fan was watching the Saints win the Super Bowl against Indianapolis. I say that because my first Saints game was in 1987. Jim Everett was having a field day in New Orleans. Saints did a great job coming back. I was there for all of the losses, all of the wins, all of the near wins and near misses, but these since 2000 2006 Saints fans are all all they know is Saints wins and the reason why I know this because growing up they were all Cowboy fans they were all Washington football team fans they were all San Francisco 49er fans and now everyone is a Saints fan I used to go to the Saints games all the time in high school some with a ticket some without a ticket I'm not gonna say how but <laughs> watching the Saints finally win the Super Bowl was my best Super Bowl memory that's an awesome. That was an epic Super Bowl. Um, you know, I was on a bachelor party with my buddy Garrett, same one who talked me into this bet that Breach says is a loser. And uh, we were we were deciding between we were going to go to uh, down to Wrightsville Beach 
or New Orleans, and we all decided the logistics were just easier, so we went to Rightful Beach. We would have been in New Orleans with the Saints won the Super Bowl. I still don't forgive him for it. It's unbelievable. That's a great that's a great memory, Emery, and uh, man, what a what an epic. Sean Payton at the onside kick. All right, we got to go. Emery's going to bounce out of here and go hang out in the sports book a little bit. Keep grinding on that beat, and uh, we will be back after this break on the Pick 6 Podcast Show here on CBS Sports HQ. Show here on CBS Sports HQ presented by Guinness. We are 20 minutes away from that first Guinness of the afternoon hitting my lips. Joining us to do talk some insider news, some injuries, etc. The one, the only, Jason Lock and Fora, uh, JLC. Thanks for hopping on with us. I'll throw it out to you in a general fashion here. Uh, go with it whichever way you want because there's several of them that, that are notable, I think. But what's the injury report looking like for the Chiefs and the Bucks as we head into the weekend? First of all, I'm shocked that you're not sponsored by, like, Jimmy's Tattoo Shack of Syracuse, New York, knowing <laughs> all the shenanigans going on between you knuckleheads. Um, but, yeah, look, I think all things all things, you know, being equal, both these teams are, are pretty healthy. Obviously, we know the Chiefs' offensive line situation isn't ideal, and those are long-term injuries and opt-outs that have affected that. Um, but in terms of the, of the rest of, of their injury situation, you know, Sammy Watkins looks a whole lot better to play now than he did at the beginning of the week. I don't know how big of a role he'll have, but they seem pretty bullish on, on him being active unless something goes wrong um, in warm-ups. Obviously, Antonio Brown has trended in a positive direction throughout the week. Uh, I know they're listing him as questionable, but he's practiced fully two straight days. I'm pretty sure Tom Brady's buddy will be up for this game. Cameron Brait, though, with that back situation is one that I would keep an eye on. You know, he's listed as questionable. That's um, maybe not a certainty on the other side of the ball for Tampa, though. That secondary is back in full force, and they're obviously facing a unique challenge there with Patrick Mahomes in this passing game. So all hands on deck, and they've got their starting safeties ready to go. Uh, I have no comment on the tattoo remarks by JLC, but uh, I have called my lawyer, Jason, so you can talk to him when he rings you up. Uh, as for the injury concerns, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you probably are. Uh, my, my wife's pumped, by the way, too, about this nonsense talk about a Ryan Finley tattoo. That's a time for, that's a show for a, another occasion. So Demarcus Robinson is off the COVID list. Uh, so he's doing better than I am right now. That's good news for him. Good news for that Chiefs offense. Uh, you mentioned Sammy Watkins, who I actually like a lot. Uh, so depending on what Robinson's status is, I think Sammy Watkins can have a big role uh, in Sunday's game. He has that calf injury, hasn't played six weeks, 16. I talked in the previous segment about how I think he could have a big night uh, in, in terms of prop bets, especially if the Buccaneers try to double team their two best receivers in Tyreek and, and, Jason, and, and uh, Travis Kelsey there. So I'm looking for Sammy Watkins to come out and contribute early. He's had at least 74 receiving yards the last four postseason games. I think he's going to do something similar if he's anywhere close to 100%. Uh, and with the injuries here, I actually think the Buccaneers are dealing with the brunt of it. Obviously, Eric Fisher won't be playing because of the Achilles, as JLC mentioned. But you're talking about, you know, your two safeties are coming off of injuries where they've been banged up for the past 10 days. And now their first action is going to be out in the field against Patrick Mahomes. And the Buccaneers really need them to be at the top of their game because we saw what happened the last time the Buccaneers and Chiefs met. Uh, Patrick Mahomes threw for 462 yards. Tyree Kill had more than 200 yards in the first quarter. Uh, so, it, you know, if Tampa Bay secondary isn't ready to go, uh, they could get diced up right off the bat in that first quarter. Uh, and then obviously Antonio Brown out there now. I think that's big for Tampa Bay. Just so Tom Brady has somebody to throw to besides uh, Mike Evans. Well, you know he, they have a lot of weapons, but I think Brady is more comfortable when he has Antonio Brown out there, and I think that makes the Buccaneers' offense better. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway for me when it comes to these uh, these injuries is that with. Be ready to move quickly into the prop market because if for some reason Cameron Brait is out, uh, you could end up seeing some real value on the other tight ends, Rob Gronkowski receiving yards, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if, if if Antonio Brown is out, I think Chris Godwin's props would, would bump up a little bit. Uh, you know, same deal for Sammy, Sammy Watkins, Demarcus Robinson. I'm not saying, you know, we know whether or not they'll play, but for DFS and, and prop betting purposes, certainly you want to keep an eye on that injury report and wait till we find out who is active and who is not. Uh, JLC, it's, there's a lot of buzz going on that Carson Wentz, is looking to to get out of Philly. What are you hearing on Wentz uh, trade speculation? Where he might go um, and when this might actually happen? Yeah, 
There's a lot of smoke. I wouldn't say a whole lot of fire. I talked to people in the Eagles organization earlier this week who said, by the weekend, you're going to hear all these rumors about things being hot and heavy because we're hearing from some reporters that they're, they're going to report that uh, one way or the other. They've received some exploratory phone calls. Nothing's really gotten off the ground. Um, other teams have obvious reservations about Carson Wentz's contract. Um, the Eagles are not in a situation right now where they seem inclined to just eat $10 million and do a salary dump just to get him out of there, to try to placate him. Um, Nick Sirianni is intrigued by both quarterbacks from what I've heard and, and would be content to let that play out and let the best man win. And again, Carson Wentz may not want to hear that, but he's not in Deshaun Watson's situation. He does not have the kind of leverage that some other players we've seen in recent years have to force their way out of situations, whether it's Khalil Mack, whether it's Jalen Ramsey. Um, that's just not the case here. Now, if he wants to leave $6 million on the table like Yannick Ngakwe did in Jacksonville, that's one thing. But he's not there yet. The Eagles aren't like, we got to get him out of here mode. And, you know, the Colts have a little bit of interest. Maybe the Bears. But, again, very sort of surface-level discussions. Nothing imminent. Nothing particularly hot. If it does happen, I have always thought the Colts would be the most realistic team. Obviously, the Colts had interest in Matt Stafford as well. They could not compete, ultimately, or chose not to compete with all those picks that the Rams put on the table. So if it's not the Colts, guys, frankly, I'm not so sure it happens. All right, well, uh, what about Deshaun Watson? Uh, GM, Colts GM Chris Ballard said he couldn't talk about him today, but he just wants him out of the division. Uh, are things moving in Deshaun Watson's uh, a favorable way for Watson? Does it sound like he's going to be uh, sort of digging heels in here in Houston? Yeah, this one's going to take some time to play out. Um, this is the, the complete opposite of the Stafford situation where you had quarterback, coach, GM, ownership, all aligned to let's facilitate this, let's get it done as soon as possible, let's have a clean break. Um, you know, there's still this mindset in Houston that, you know, David Culley uh, and, and I guess Nick Casario could sort of mend fences and make this um, into some sort of kumbaya situation. I frankly don't see that being the case, but I mean, I, I told you, Will, weeks ago that um, this wasn't going to be a wham bam thank you man thing where they just you know okay we got a new coach now we're going to trade this guy and get all we can get this may be one that plays out till much closer to the draft at a certain point can Nick Casario go to the owner and say look I've got this boffo um, you know a assortment of three first rounders and two second rounders and a player and why why risk him not being here for OTAs because he's not going to be there for OTAs if they even exist why risk having a rookie GM and a rookie head coach with no quarterback at training camp right and figuring out which backup we're going to give the reps to it's it's probably not the way to go and if Deshaun Watson is stuck in enough that he rides this thing out to the spring then there will be teams still waiting with open arms prior to the draft whether that be the Panthers, whether that be the Jets, maybe the Miami Dolphins, you could make a case for others. But if the Jets really want to get into this thing, guys, because of the draft pick situation they have, I'm not sure anybody would be able to keep pace with Joe Douglas if he's ready to go to the mat for Deshaun Watson. But again, that's for down the line. Right now, they're still at loggerheads over his future in Houston. All right. Uh, we'll get you out of here on this. JLC, you're a longtime veteran of the NFL beat. You've seen some big games in your day. What's your uh, what's your favorite Super Bowl moment, working or otherwise? Um, for me, I'd probably go back to my first Super Bowl at CBS um, down there in New Orleans in 2013, 2012 season with the Ravens playing the Saints. Um, obviously, a crazy Super Bowl with the lights going out and running around the building trying to find blueprints and, and you know, information with a flashlight as to what happened here. Uh, that was crazy. But, you know, with the Ravens uh, being in the Super Bowl, I had a lot of friends and family who were down there. So partying with them all week was a lot of fun. Hanging out with Michael Phelps and Josh Charles on the sidelines pregame name dropper was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and our set was right on the sidelines. And we got to watch the first half literally from the sidelines then we went into the green room then all hell broke loose uh with the lights going out but it was cool to have my wife there um and it was a great year at cbs i've been blessed to be here so i'll go with that one i love it that's a great one uh oh man i might 
I might have to change mine. I love that New Orleans Super Bowl. Nothing better than a Super Bowl in New Orleans. I say put it there full time, permanent. Uh, just keep Breach away from the circuit breakers. I don't know if you know this, JLC. He's actually the one who triggered the lights because he wanted to take control of the live blog and get hired to the NFL team full time. A very Breachian, uh, you know, sort of little finger move by the by the master mm -hmm. of, uh, of of rogue techniques. JLC, as always, thanks for talking to us. Uh, great to see you, buddy. Enjoy Tampa. We will talk to you soon. We'll be right back after this break on CBS Sports HQ. Welcome back to the podcast presented by Guinness here on CBS Sports HQ. It's time now to highlight a player who is made of more presented by Guinness. And we're going to touch on an underrated defender in Super Bowl 55. Drafted in the second round of 2019, cornerback Sean Murphy Bunting has made no greater impact to the Bucs than this, po than this postseason. Recording an interception in each of Tampa Bay's three games leading up to the Super Bowl. His three interceptions came when covering Terry McLaurin, and Michael Thomas and Alan Lazard. Go along with the three picks. Murphy Bunting has 13 tackles and two pass deflections while only allowing 40 yards per game to opposing wide receivers in this stretch. And he will have his hands full in the Super Bowl with an explosive Chiefs offense. John Murphy Bunting. Made of more presented by Guinness. All right, let's get to the end of the show. We'll talk about our favorite Super Bowl moments. Ryan Wilson, I will start with you. And I'm going to guess, being that you're a Steelers homer and that you don't like working, that you're going to pick something before before your time at CBS. Because you know what? They haven't won one since you got here. Yeah, that's true. They didn't. So thanks for pointing that out. But I will go back to a Steelers victory. February 1st, 2009, Super Bowl 43. In Raymond James Stadium in Tampa Bay, there's that catch by Santonio Holmes in the back of the end zone with less than a minute to go. The Seals were trailing 23-20 at that point because if you remember, Kurt Warner and Larry Fitzgerald, that 65-yard touchdown, put them ahead with two minutes to go. The Cardinals thought they were going to win a Super Bowl. Big Ben marched down the field, uh, got them from the 12-yard line into the end zone. And the thing you remember about that, if you rewatch that game, is Big Ben was actually pretty mobile. He was sort of the front runner of these mobile, athletic, strong arm quarterbacks we see today. Big Ben ain't that guy anymore, but he was then for that moment. St. Antonio Holmes made a fantastic catch, and Steelers fans are forever grateful. Uh, my favorite Super Bowl moment is simultaneously my favorite and least favorite. We go all the way back to January 1989, Super Bowl 23, the Bengals versus the 49ers. My dad, Jim Breach, is kicking in the game, and with three minutes and 20 seconds left, he hits a 40-yard field goal to put the Bengals up 16 to 13. That was literally probably the happiest moment of my life, but it only lasted for about two minutes and 50 more seconds because Joe Montana drove the 49ers on one of the most iconic Super Bowl drives of all time, 92 yards down the field. He hit John Taylor with a 10-yard touchdown pass, and they won the game 20-16. to 16. He saw John Candy in the end zone or something. I don't know. I've been trying to repress that memory my whole entire life. Uh, if he doesn't throw that touchdown pass, maybe my dad wins MVP, and I don't have to work with these guys because I'm out living on a Caribbean island somewhere. But that's not what happened. The 49ers <laughs> won, and I have to hang out with Brenton and Wilson every day now. Yeah, only a Bengals fan would pick like the worst moment of his life as the best <laughs> Super Bowl memory. <laughs> uh, my favorite Super Bowl is uh, Super Bowl 49 between the Patriots and the Seahawks. I was sitting next to Ryan Wilson. We had a red eye flight out of Arizona, and it looked like it was going to overtime, and we were freaking out. And then you see the Malcolm, the Malcolm Butler interception. I felt bad for Russell Wilson and the Seahawks, but just the the, the most incredible game I think uh, you know in Super Bowl history. And so I loved it. All right, very quickly, bold predictions. Wilson hit me. Uh, Sammy Watkins leads the Chiefs on targets. I want to mention more importantly, Brees just said the happiest moment of his life was that Super Bowl. He's been married and he has a newborn baby. <laughs> Not fair. Happiest sports moment. This is a Super Bowl moment. Uh, my bold prediction is this is the highest scoring Super Bowl ever. The record is 75 points. Uh, I'll say this one goes 76. We'll say 41 35 Chiefs. All right, I, uh, I like it. I'm going to say my bold prediction is the same one that I had on the podcast. It said Tyree Kill, the cheetah. He breaks Jerry Rice's record for receiving yards in a Super Bowl. Tobbles 215. I think he goes to 250, maybe even wins Super Bowl MVP. We'll have to wait and see. You'll have to wait and see. Much more coverage of the Super Bowl coming on CBS Sports HQ. Enjoy your Friday and see you guys soon.